you. It's, uh, it's been a, a fascinating uh, two days uh, hearing about some of the research and science that's going on both in Canada and, uh, and elsewhere. And I think also for me to get a, an insight into some of the great research that's being done in genomics in Canada. My job uh, this afternoon is to talk to you about wheat. Uh, so we're going from the, the conversations or discussions this morning about quite complex populations of very many organisms to a single organism. And I suppose the first question is why wheat and uh, why is wheat regarded as being so important? And I thought I should start by just giving you a little bit of a context here. I think as everybody here knows, the, uh, the cereals make up over 50% of uh, world food. And uh, I've tried here to summarize a few numbers uh, about wheat and the role of wheat as a, as a source of food. And you'll see from the table there that although maize is the number one cereal globally in terms of production, uh, most maize that's produced actually goes for industrial purposes, uh, for biofuels, for um, various uh, uh, plastics and various other products that come from maize, whereas most wheat that's produced globally is actually used for human food. So by far of all of the plants, wheat is the single most important source of food for humans. It's the most important source of carbohydrate and our most important source of proteins. The other thing that that table shows us is that relative to the other cereals, the other three, other two major cereals, wheat is low yielding at just over three tonnes per hectare uh, on average across the world. If we take out the irrigated regions of India and China from that, you'll find that in rain-fed systems, non-irrigated systems, average wheat yields are, are well below two tonnes per hectare. And given that this crop can yield uh, as much as 15 tonnes, it means that most environments where wheat is being produced, about 80 to 90 per cent of the yield potential is lost due to a whole range of factors. And the single most important factor is water. Uh, wheat tends to be grown in environments where water is limiting. I think the other important thing about wheat and about the cereals generally is the amount that's actually traded. So I have here, there's some numbers. In 2009, there were two and a half trillion tonnes of cereal produced globally. And as you can see from the other numbers, most of that was the three top cereals. Of that, though, only about 330 million tonnes was traded. Now, for some cereals like rice, rice is by and large consumed in the countries where it's being produced. Uh, whereas wheat is the most traded of all of the food commodities. And so fluctuations in global cereal prices have particularly big impacts upon wheat and upon the many countries in the world that rely on wheat as a primary source of food. So yesterday, uh, we heard about the, uh, some of the great breakthroughs that have been happening in medical research. And you heard examples of how some of the new technologies and some of the genomic developments have impacted on the lives of uh, hundreds, thousands, and I think we even heard a case where millions of people were affected by some of the new uh, medical technologies that were developed. But if you really want to work in an area of genomics that has the opportunity to affect hundreds of millions of people, work on wheat. Okay. So in the title of this talk, I said that we have ambitious targets for wheat production globally. And this graph here is really to try and summarize that. If you look at what's been happening with maize and wheat yields, over the past 50 or 60 years, the improvements have been spectacular. These are the green revolution uh, technologies that were developed. And it was essentially three prime technologies that occurred. The first was the expansion of irrigation schemes, particularly in India and China. The second was the use of nitrogenous fertilizers that have increased by over 700% over that period. And the third was breeding technologies. Of those three platforms, Advances in breeding and breeding technologies is really the only one that we can regard as sustainable. The biggest energy consumption, and you heard a little bit about this this morning, the biggest energy consumption for, for wheat and for cereals generally is through uh, supply of nitrogenous fertilizers. But if you also look at those graphs there, there are predictions about what we need to do with production in going forward to 2050. If we can follow the current rate of trend, then you see the lower lines, but if we're gonna feed nine billion people, we need to follow the upper line. And that is a very, very significant challenge. We need to improve yields of wheat by over 60% to meet those targets and those challenges. So what can we do? And what are the options for genomics in that? There are a number of advantages we have in wheat. And in really trying to consider what might happen with wheat, uh, I think there are a couple of points that also need to be made here. Firstly, in contrast to many other crops, the adoption rate for modern varieties of wheat around the world is very good. And that graph there compares wheat with rice, maize, and a number of other important uh, um, uh, carbohydrate sources that are used particularly in uh, uh, poorer countries. 
And you'll see there that by and large, the adoption rate for wheat pretty well everywhere of new varieties is in excess of 80%, which is, which is really very good. So we have good delivery mechanisms if we can produce the varieties. But there are some significant changes occurring in wheat breeding globally as we speak. And in many respects for wheat researchers, it is an exciting time, but also sometimes a worrying time. Until recently, nearly all wheat breeding, with, with the possible exception of Europe, was in the public domain. Over the past few years, we've seen an increasing interest from the private sector, and we've seen many countries privatise their wheat breeding activities. And I understand that Canada is in the process of doing this as well. There are advantages and disadvantages of that. One of the advantages is that it will hopefully stimulate commercial investment and that may help us try and achieve the rates of gain that, uh, that maize have achieved. There are also opportunities for significant public-private partnerships. But there's also a danger of a disconnect between some of the research, some of the basic research, some of the research that we're doing in genomics and the delivery. And so I think we need to keep in our, in our minds always that we need to maintain a very good relationship between the research that we're doing and the way in which breeding goes forward. Given that we're at the cusp of this commercialization of wheat, it is a critical time for us to be aware of this and to include that in our planning and our discussions. Okay, now on to genome and genomics. The wheat genome is, uh, quite frankly, awful to work with. It's very big, almost six times the size of the human genome. Wheat is a hexaploid, so we don't only have one genome, we've got three genomes to work with, and it's often a real struggle to try and tell the three apart because they're very similar. We estimate that there are about 35,000 genes per genome, making the total number of genes in wheat around 100,000, which is a lot. And, of course, most of the genome is repetitive, which makes a lot of the assembly and the analysis work very difficult. We don't have a genome sequence, but I think it's very auspicious. I gather that, uh, and I hadn't actually realized this, that uh, this meeting is partly uh, a, a commemoration of 10 years since the launch of the draft human genome sequence. Coincidentally, yesterday, two important papers, articles appeared in Nature. One was on the first detailed assembly of the wheat genome. It's not a genome sequence, but it's essentially a description of all of the genes and the assignment of those genes to the, uh, the individual genomes. And that's a really important and significant advance. The other important thing that had other important article yesterday in Nature was essentially an assembly of the barley genome. And I've just lifted one picture from that, uh, that barley paper, which basically gives a physical and genetic location of every gene or virtually every gene within the barley genome. Now, wheat and barley are very closely related. Barley, however, is a diploid, so it's a hell of a lot easier to work with. You can actually make fertile hybrids between wheat and barley, even though it's technically quite difficult. So they're closely related. So this barley genome framework will be very important for us going forward in wheat. Currently, with, uh, with wheat, there are a series of strategies that are being developed or being deployed to try and assemble a full genome sequence. Probably the best sequence we'll ultimately get is from this chromosome by chromosome assembly, but I won't bore you with the details about the technologies around that. But basically, there is a, a large international consortium working to try and get a complete genome sequence. But I think it's important to realize that just yesterday, we saw significant breakthroughs in those two publications for wheat and barley. Okay, now if we're going to try and look at the way in which genomics can impact upon uh, such a species of wheat, we have to be aware of the context that we're working within. So wheat has probably been, of all of our crop plants, has been systematically bred for the longest, for over a, a hundred years. And given that wheat was our first domesticated crop about 10,000 years ago, there's been selection and improvement of wheat by growers over a very long period of time. If we're going to demonstrate the benefit of genomics, we have to show benefits over and above what can be achieved by current breeding methods and practices. This is uh, uh, just half of the pedigree of one modern Australian uh, wheat variety, really to try and emphasize that we're actually building on a very long history and base of systematic breeding and improvement. So, how can, we, how can we really try and achieve these gains? Remember our target, our target is a 60% increase in wheat yields uh, globally, which is a very, very challenging target. Well, there are a number of things that can be done. Firstly, we can continue with conventional breeding. As you saw, we've been able to main, maintain good steady rates of yield gain over a very long sustained period for wheat. We need to maintain those activities, we need to maintain breeding activities. 
But importantly, we need to look at expanding the germplasm base, and I'll return to that point in a moment. There are significant opportunities through uh, molecular breeding, and this is really where some of the genomics platforms are important. Mark-resisted selection, using whole genome screening for the analysis of uh, 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 varieties and for selecting individuals from breeding populations, and of course, genetic engineering offers us uh, substantial opportunities for significant improvement. Then there are the somewhat more long-term approaches and strategies, such as, you know, can we really look at developing a hybrid wheat? Wheat is an inbred crop. If we could have hybrids, could we capture the benefits of heterosis for yield improvement? But probably more importantly for a crop like, uh, like wheat, we know that hybrids tend to have greater yield stability, better stress tolerance, and it also gives us an opportunity to manage disease resistance more effectively. And then there are even further uh, approaches and strategies that can be used. Could we go to perennial wheats? Uh, could we look at having wheats that are nitrogen fixing? Can we convert wheat into uh, a more efficient photosynthetic organism than it is at the moment? So there are also some very long-term strategies. Now, in all of these approaches, genomics has and is playing a role. This is a rather busy and complex slide, for which I apologize, but I was trying here to sort of summarize where genomics sits within the broader scene of how we go about practical improvement. So what are the practicalities of running a genomics program that is going to feed into uh, active and dynamic breeding programs? So the center of this diagram is really around the, the genomics platforms and technologies. And I'm using a broad definition of genomics here. It's not only about the genes, it's looking at the effects of the genes. It's looking at the phenotype of the organisms. It's using data and information that are coming from metabolite profiling, protein profiling, to develop mathematical models about how the plants are responding and interacting with the environment. Again, I'll return to that point later. This can feed out in two ways. It can feed out through individual genes that can allow us to design genetic idiotypes, a, a system or a scheme that we can target within our breeding activities. Or it can feed into a much broader view of the genome and managing the genome. There are a whole set of new methods around developing breeding values associated with particular individuals within a population and then biasing your population or breeding uh, program in that direction. These are dependent upon having the ability to monitor and track our genomes very broadly. Okay, we have and we do know a lot about the wheat genome already. Uh, there are a lot of markers that have been developed across the genome. And this is sort of just a summary of markers that are actively being used within breeding programs. It becomes quite important and difficult to track and monitor particular components and regions. Many of the genes are closely situated. We need to break up these linkage groups if we're going to go forward and make advantages. Okay, I mentioned before about the use of variation. Wheat is a, is a hexapoid, it is quite complicated. We estimate that only about 10% of the natural variation in wheat and its wild relatives has been captured within breeding programs. One of the key activities now is to try and look at ways in which we can bring some of that variation into the programs. This is quite complicated and difficult. And if you look here, I've just tried to summarize sort of the evolution of wheat through the polyploidization processes that has given us the tetraploid wheats or the durum or pasta wheats and the hexaploid wheats. We know many of the wild relatives, but if you look at some of the pictures here, you can see they're a long way removed from bread wheat. So a key problem that we try to deal with is how do we screen and analyze unadapted germplasm for traits or gene variants that will be of value within a, uh, a modern breeding program. And this involves us to try and use predictive phenotyping, to try and use surrogate phenotypes that we can use and analyze. There's a diagram here showing how metabolite profiling can be linked to particular traits and how we can then use metabolites or an individual metabolite to track a stress tolerance uh, region. But there are significant problems in evaluating unadapted germplasm, and for wheat there are also significant issues and problems associated with integrating that new variation within a breeding program and getting effective recombination. So as I said, the phenotyping is, is, is quite complex and difficult. We have a whole series of new platforms and developments that are supporting these. But I think we need to be aware that for, uh, for some of the platforms, and there's an illustration down here on the bottom right, of a, a single pot imaging system that allows us to measure growth rates, it's important to remember that we're working with a plant that grows and performs as a community. And so in many respects, the old field trials give us the most accurate simulation or representation. I've got another example here of some large bins we use for doing preliminary evaluation of transgenic germplasm, where we can grow essentially transgenic plants as a community under containment 
and then do, use that as preliminary analysis. But the phenotyping issue and problem is a significant one for us to manage and deal with. Okay, one of the problems is that yield and performance of a plant, particularly a crop plant such as wheat, is the result of a complex interaction between the plant and the environment over a developmental period and stage. So in order to try and work out the best strategies and approaches for, uh, for selecting and modifying that plant, we need to be aware of the environmental changes and shifts that will be occurring over that period of time. Most stresses that are going to impact upon yield, and remember I said at the beginning that the single most important limitation for wheat production globally is availability of water. This is not a stress that occurs in isolation, but it's in combination with a number of other factors that will impact upon performance. So heat stress obviously is important, salt stress provides an osmotic shock, and nitrogen can, man uh, can modify the biomass generation. And in some cases, we see genes or alleles operating in reverse effects depending upon the environment in which the plant is being grown. And there's an example here of a particular allele that's associated with yield and can give about a 15% yield benefit in a situation where drought and heat stress are in combination, but actually gives you a yield penalty in high yielding environments. Okay, the other thing of course that's important in this whole scenario is what's happening below the surface. Again here, genomics has been important in allowing us to analyze what's happening within the soil and to the roots of the plant. So there are now systems available where we can extract total DNA from soil, we can measure pathogen loads uh, within the soil, and we can also measure the root distribution based upon the, the plant DNA in different regions of the soil. And this gives us important clues about how the plant may be responsing, responding to particular environmental signals and how we can maybe develop the best selection and breeding strategy. Okay, well I wanted just to conclude with, uh, a, I think, a significant development that's occurred in the last year uh, with respect to wheat. Last year, the G20 countries decided to uh, launch a, a new initiative, it's called the Wheat Initiative, which is really aimed to try and stimulate collaboration internationally around wheat research, to try and improve the ways in which platforms, resources, germplasm and other uh, materials that are important for wheat improvement are being shared. Canada, of course, as a member of the G20, was an important supporter of that initiative. That initiative is now, uh, uh, now up and running uh, and will be providing a framework to try and develop these new platforms uh, for, for wheat improvement. So finally, you know, where are we? Well, we have really significant challenges. That target of 60 pence yield increase is, of course, a very, uh, uh, very big target and is going to be challenging to pretty well all researchers globally. But even though there are many challenges, there are a whole series of solutions that can be applied to these. I've tried very quickly this afternoon to summarize some of those key issues and developments. In pretty well all of these areas, genomics has a role and is playing a role in to try uh, and meet these difficulties and challenges. But thank you.